Good evening. I'd just like to say that Tomiko Brown Nakin's Civil Rights Queen is one of the best biographies I've ever read about anyone, anywhere. Uh, but the fact that it was written about my mother is particularly stunning and exciting. So I hope you will enjoy the discussion. Uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, thank Harold Holzer and Roosevelt House for the wonderful programming they've been doing over the last few years and, and Roosevelt House itself for many years before. And also thank Jennifer Rabb, who has supported Roosevelt House and upheld the values of academic excellence and progress in society that my mother felt so dearly about and worked so hard for all of her life. Thank you, Joel, for those poignant words. I'm Harold Holzer, director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, it's a real pleasure to welcome you back to the Roosevelt House stage, albeit the virtual version. Thanks, Joel, too, for your committed and longtime service on the Roosevelt House Advisory Board. It precedes my arrival by some time, where your insight and guidance have really helped us a move forward toward our goal of civic discourse on the most crucial policy matters of the day. The last time that Roosevelt House had the opportunity to feature Joel in a program was uh, back in 2019 before we went into isolation. It was for a screening of the terrific documentary that he produced about his mother, who is the subject of this evening's program. It was called The Trials of Constance Baker Motley. So we're particularly honored that you completed the circle here and joined us again as we gather now to discuss an important new biography of the judge. We feel privileged and proud at Roosevelt House to share this personal connection to a woman who is at the center of not only today's special event, but as a colossal figure of 20th century American jurisprudence as well. The visionary and groundbreaking legal pioneer, Constance Baker Motley, whom I was privileged to meet several times many years ago in the company of her great friend and my one-time boss, Congresswoman Bella Abzer. Constance Baker Motley was hired by Thurgood Marshall to join the NAACP's legal team, becoming its only black woman, a calling that took her away from her husband and her infant son in New York for weeks at a time to work in the Southern legal system. For many Southern judges and juries, she was the first black female lawyer they had ever seen a champion, as Joel alluded to, for equality in education, she wrote the original complaint in Brown v. Board of Education and helped gain the right for Black students to enter institutions of learning. Judge Motley's career went on to include a litany of firsts. She was the first Black woman to argue a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. She was the first black woman elected to the New York State Senate. She was the first woman, of course, the first black woman elected Manhattan Borough President. That's where I began to uh, see Judge Motley in action when she was Borough President of Manhattan. And at the appointment of Lyndon Johnson, as we know, she was the very first black woman named to a federal judgeship. How many milestones in one career? So now the entirety of the history she made has been brilliantly illuminated and contextualized for the first time in a major biography, the monumental and, as it turns out, very timely civil rights queen, Constance Baker Motley and the struggle for equality. Thank you to Tamiko Brown Nagan, its author, for joining us tonight for this important discussion, which is a, a key part of our Black History Month observances, and of course the capstone here at the end of February. It follows appropriately last week's panel of Black women jurists who gave insightful consideration to the significance of representation at all levels of the judiciary from the New York Supreme Court and criminal courts to the US Supreme Court. 
when President Biden reaffirmed his intention to replace outgoing Justice Breyer with a black woman, national print and television news outlets, outlets seeking historic context for the nomination knew whom to call on. And so if you uh, believe that you have seen Ms. Brown Nagin repeatedly and, and recently on television, you're absolutely right. She's made many appearances uh, to discuss the imminent appointment of a black woman to the United States Supreme Court and has also spoken about this extraordinary book uh, in which she delivers a really uh, in immersive and enthralling tale that takes readers inside the parallel struggles for gender equality and racial equality in the United States. Tamiko Brown Nagin, whom we're excited to welcome tonight, is also the author of Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement, which won the prestigious Bancroft Prize. In addition to her acclaimed study of the past, she cares for the future, which fit in, right, fits right into our Hunter College motto, Nihi Kura Futuri, the care of the future is mine. In Ms. Brown Nagin's case, it uh, takes the form of her service as Dean of Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She also serves there as the Daniel P. S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School and chair of the university's groundbreaking Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery. Her Harvard uh, colleague, previous Roosevelt House guest, history powerhouse, and my good friend, Annette Gordon-Reed, has called Civil Rights Queen, the book we're going to discuss tonight, a brilliant work, elegantly written and deeply researched, which does complete justice to the life of Constance Baker Motley, one of the 20th century's towering figures. This evening, it's our goal to do justice to the book. To that end, uh, we've invited to lead tonight's discussion, and we're pleased to welcome back to Roosevelt House, a Hunter College professor of history, DeWeston Haywood. His teaching and work focuses on civil rights and black protest, intellectual history, culture, and political thought in the public sphere. The author of Let Us Make Men, the 20th Century Black Press and a Manly Vision for Racial Advancement, the Weston continues to advance the scholarship of racial justice and injustice, including intersections with gender uh, in, in, in many cases through the innovative new form uh, which, uh, which fuses history and hip hop. Before we begin, just a note on how the program will run. Um, you will hear um, our author in conversation with uh, Professor Haywood. At the conclusion of the discussion, we will turn to audience Q&A, facilitated by our Roosevelt House public programming curator, Mac Barrett. But at any time throughout the program, you can type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You know, stack up the questions now and you'll be the first on the roster to have your questions posed. Our guests will address as many of the questions as time allows. Another feature on your Zoom screen allows you to purchase a copy of Civil Rights Queen from our official bookstore, Shakespeare and Company. And I hope you will do that. I've read the book and it's extraordinary. Um, Connie Motley, as those who knew her, called her emerges not only as a visionary, but as a woman who sacrificed much to achieve much for many. With that, please welcome Tamiko Brown Nagin in conversation with the Weston Haywood on Constance Baker Motley. Uh, thank you, Harold, for uh, that introduction. And, and thank you, uh, Professor Brown Nagin, for uh, joining us this evening uh, to discuss this important and timely book, uh, Civil Rights Queen Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality. And uh, you'll share with us uh, a passage from, from the book. 
I will. And first, I, I want to say thanks to Harold for that lovely introduction. Thanks to Roosevelt House for hosting me. And I also want to express my gratitude to Joel Motley, uh, to you, Dr. Haywood, to Mac and the events team for their participation tonight. I'm really delighted to be here this evening. I will turn to reading a, from a chapter of my book. It is on Constance Baker Motley's most famous case, that is the battle to desegregate the University of Mississippi. This man has got to be crazy, Thurgood Marshall yelled to Motley in January of 1961. That's your case. Marshall had descended upon Motley's office waving a letter from James Meredith. The missive contained such a preposterous idea that Marshall thought the writer must be out of his mind. I am submitting an application for admission to the University of Mississippi, Meredith wrote, and I am anticipating encountering difficulty with the various agencies here in the state. In view of the brewing trouble, Meredith requested Marshall's legal assistance. After Marshall finished laughing about Meredith's proposal to sue Ole Miss, he washed his hands of the case. Marshall knew Motley had the smarts and the courtroom skills to do the job, and he thought her gender would be an advantage. The fight to desegregate Ole Miss might get someone killed, but in the context of Mississippi's white supremacist yet chivalrous culture, as Marshall saw it, a black woman would fare better than a black man. Any white supremacist, he opined, would scarcely think twice about murdering a black man but might hesitate to lynch a black woman. The very idea of a black woman lawyer violently clashed with the worldview of Dugas Shands Esquire, the white male lawyer who defended Ole Miss. Shands refused to address the ink fund lawyer in the customary manner as Mrs. Motley. Instead, he, he used only indirect references to her, calling Motley her or she. At one point early on, Motley jumped to her feet in a bid to put an end to the charade. But the tipping point occurred when Shans called her Constance. Motley immediately objected. I would like for Mr. Shans not to call me by my first name, Motley insisted. Henceforth, the lawyer referred to Motley as the New York Counsel. After months of struggle and endless delays, Meredith had had enough. Browbeaten by white resistance, Meredith wrote to Motley, resigned. I will not attempt to obtain an undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi, the letter proclaimed. Keenly aware that Motley, who had poured herself into the case, would be disappointed with this decision, Meredith pleaded for understanding. I am human after all, he wrote. Meredith had grown tired of waiting for a deliverance that never came. Life had passed him by. His peers had graduated from college, begun careers, and moved on with their lives. In the meantime, he and his family had endured a high cost, fighting to integrate the University of Mississippi. Motley was stunned by this message. In order to salvage her case and support her client, she morphed from lawyer to therapist, a role she often played in high stakes civil rights cases. To get a handle on the fraught situation, the pair would talk in Motley's New York City apartment where Meredith could face taste freedom. There, Motley cajoled Meredith. She persuaded him that he had gone too far and that too much had been invested in the case by the Ink Fund and the Federal Court of Appeals to abandon the litigation. Just as Meredith reached his breaking point, support arrived precisely as Motley had promised. On September 10th, 1962, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black intervened, halting any further action preventing James Meredith's matriculation to Ole Miss. While in Mississippi, Motley built community with a small band of lawyers and activists who took part in LDF's effort to end Jim Crow in the state. She leaned on Megar Evers, the NAACP's most prominent operative in Mississippi, who often invited Motley to his home, where she enjoyed home-cooked meals and fellowship with Evers, his wife, and their children. 
But only one month after Motley left Mississippi for the last time, Megger Evers was assassinated. It devastated her. Motley couldn't get out of her bed for weeks following his death. She couldn't even bring herself to attend his funeral. Nevertheless, she had left the state victorious. Constance Baker Motley emerged as one of the most respected lawyers in America. A story in the New York Times titled Integration's Advocate captured the professional heights to which Motley has soared. A tall, striking woman with piercing dark eyes is almost always in the courtroom in the eye of the hurricane surrounding the struggle for civil rights in the South, the article read. Motley's fight to desegregate Ole Miss brought her public esteem and professional success, along with devastating loss and profound pain. Thank you. Uh, so, so thank you for that. And, and, and thank you too for writing this uh, brilliant uh, piece of scholarship uh, that, that will not only be uh, as Cheryl uh, Cashin writes on the, uh, the book jacket, an instant classic, uh, but also one of those uh, paradigm shifting texts that moves the historiography into new considerations and new directions. Um, and as uh, Harold mentioned in his comments, um, the, the book has taken on a new resonance and new urgency, right? Uh, in light of the president's uh, big announcement on, on Friday. Um, so the passage you shared gets at so many of the things that I wanna explore and I have a bunch of questions uh, about the, the, the contributions and costs of, of Motley uh, her life, her career, and also the story, historiography, where we might situate this important work in histories of the long civil rights movement, the long black freedom struggle, uh, black political thought, uh, race, the law, the state, um, and racial leadership, in particular black women's racial leadership. And then where we might locate I, what I think are the book's nuanced departures even from that historiography uh, and popular memory. Um, and then I hope we can talk briefly about what uh, Motley's life and career means for this moment, uh, and then we'll uh, pivot to the audience for uh, questions. So to, to start, um, you know, this is a uh, fluidly uh, written, sweeping work. Um, the first major study on Motley um, that I think is at once a legal, institutional labor, civil rights, and women's history. Uh, and, and so I want to ask how you came to the project, but I, I want to frame it in this way. Um, your previous work, the award-winning uh, Courage to Dissent, looked at the granular and local constructions of, of uh, civil rights consciousness and protest in, in, in one city, Atlanta, vis-a-vis uh, -vis national civil rights organizations and several different actors, especially the Black lawyer, uh, A.T. Walden. But here you seem to look at civil rights through the prism of one life, one incredible life. And so, you know, I, I'd like to know how you came to the project, but also why you chose biography as the way to enter on this subject. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that wonderful framing. And uh, I, I appreciate your appreciation for the book. As to how I came to this work, I, uh, in the process of writing my book on Atlanta and the long civil rights movement, I used biographical sketches of the attorneys who litigated important cases as a way to draw readers into the book. And one of those sketches was of Constance Baker Motley. And when I was writing it, first of all, I found her fascinating. And then second, I noticed that evidently not a lot of other people did because there was relatively little scholarship about Motley. Mm -hmm. And I thought that given her tremendous impact, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, it's not just um, unfortunate, it's a kind of historical malpractice, really erasing a mm -hmm. woman uh, mm -hmm. from the, the history of the civil rights movement in a way that is, is detrimental and um, mm -hmm. just, just inaccurate. And so I did think that it would be a great opportunity to write about her um, initially, but then the, the biography piece, uh, I paused on that. Mm -hmm. And it's for a, a number of reasons. Um, first of all, the thought, it, it, in order to write a successful biography, 
one really does have to try to inhabit and recreate the world and the psyche and just everything that one can about an individual. And I didn't know that I was prepared to do that, although I, I thought I, I would be. Um, I didn't quite know. And one of the things that gave me pause is that I was writing about, I would write about not only a civil rights lawyer, but a judge. And judges are notorious about trying to um, ensure that they do not believe, do not leave behind uh, anything that could provide insights into their decision making uh, processes. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're going to write a biography, you really need to be able to say something about the interior world of the person. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was given pause, but I, I um, eventually did decide to go forward with the work, including because, um, Professor Haywood, I, I did think of this work as kind of a bookend to Civil Rights Queen. Um, if that book attempted to situate legal history within a bottom-up analysis, um, mm -hmm. then this book sort of follows the movement to the point where um, some of the warriors, as Motley did, attain power within the structures that they had been trying to reform. And that just struck me as uh, a fascinating question and an important question um, in, in the historiography writ large. And uh, so she turned out to be a vehicle to explore quite a lot of themes uh, that are important in uh, the field of civil rights, women's rights, legal history, and so forth. And, and, and uh, you know, given the era, uh, by all accounts, she should not have been a lawyer, uh, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so how does she come to the law? And, and uh, here I'm also asking, uh, you know, she, she's the daughter of, of, of immigrants. Um, in what ways was her family an incubator for a certain class and racial consciousness that, that really shaped her? So how does she arrive at the law? Um, she, she, you know, sort, sort of should have been a domestic for the era, right? But she's not. And her family is also a little different too. Could you speak on that? Happy to. It's vitally important. Uh, Motley grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, in the shadow of Yale University, where virtually all of her male relatives worked, including her father, um, who worked as a chef for a time at Skull and Bones, the Eating House, or Secret Society. And the, the parents uh, had immigrated to this country in the early 20th century from the West Indies, from Nevis, uh, which had been an important uh, uh, spot in, the, in Atlantic slavery, a lot of sugar uh, plantations there um, that were quite profitable. And yet the story I tell about the family is of a father in particular that glories in being a part of the British Empire mm -hmm. and uh, who teaches his daughter and all of the siblings that West Indians are superior to African-Americans. He doesn't even let them play with the black migrants who move up to New Haven and many other Northern cities in search of employment. And what I conclude in the book is that either because of or in spite of those teachings, Constance Baker Motley does go on to become this amazing civil rights lawyer. And so, but how does she end up uh, even aspiring to be a lawyer? I recount how um, uh, she has influences, first of all, in school with a couple of teachers mm -hmm. who uh, introduced, introduced her to um, uh, W.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, other black thinkers, to Abraham Lincoln, George Crawford, uh, a graduate of Yale Law School and an ally of the NAACP was in New Haven and introduced Motley to uh, the litigation. Um, uh, Jane Bolin, who was a black woman, first black woman to graduate from Yale Law School, went on to be a judge in New York on the domestic relations court, was a role model. And 
uh, she had a very strong social consciousness. Hmm. Um, she was growing up in the Great Depression. You could see need all around. It's an era of left liberal politics. Um, and she gets involved in any number of social organizations and ends up um, uh, with this consciousness of, of wanting to um, struggle for equity and this influence of these lawyers in books and, and some in the, in the town. And so she decides she wants to be a lawyer. And her parents and pretty much everyone around her thinks she's crazy because women don't get anywhere in the law. And besides, she's a working class black girl and it, it just seems like um, in, in, impractical. Mm -hmm. And she ends up being able to go to college and then to law school through the help of philanthropy, a white male contractor, graduate of Yale. And she goes on to pursue her, her interests first at Fisk, then she transfers to NYU and goes to Columbia Law School. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, again, given the era, so, so if she is uh, pursuing law, uh, it, she should have been considered a, a race woman, right? This is sort of like the framework for uh, the moments in which Black women's leadership was recognized. Mm -hmm. but, um, but here she's civil rights queen. Mm. Right. Um, you do well showing, you know, how that's unique. Uh, the appellation was was coined by um, a reporter at the time and, and, of course, provides the title of the book. Um, and I think the, the moniker resonates in other ways, too, politically in popular culture and popular uh, memory. Uh, deploys queen in the context of black womanhood and, and, and points that um, the book makes about uh, her embrace of respectability politics. Um, it, it, I, I think it also redeploys Queen um, for, for uh, our current moment, for um, many women who recognize it as, as a vernacular term for uh, independence, uh, excellence, control. Uh, and I think it also redeploys it against the longstanding trope of the welfare queen, Absolutely. right? Um, that still dogs the representation of, of Black women. But you illustrate how civil rights was joined to her queenness. Uh, if you will, right, in, in um, civil rights being the modifier, uh, that Motley was this warrior wielding the law like a sword of ju justice, you write, um, but she's also like wielding it as an architect, um, as a tool. Um, could you talk about the ways that, that she constructed civil rights law when there was none? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um... It, it, it is a fascinating story. She, um, be, before she even graduates from Columbia Law School, she goes down to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to see Thurgood Marshall, and he hires her on the spot to take the place of another Columbia law student, a black man who's going on to do something else. And she works there for some 20 years. Uh, you know, she starts uh, um, doing uh, work that's not in the courtroom, ends up being this amazing courtroom lawyer. Her first case is on behalf of African-American school teachers in Jackson, Mississippi. And, you know, the queenness of it all is that people haven't seen a Black lawyer, they haven't seen a woman lawyer, and here's this, like, amazing person who has this way about her. She has this bearing, this way that she carries herself. She's regal. She, um, she, she performs her gender and her race in a way that demands and commands respect. Uh, and, you know, the queen, so this journalist calls her the civil rights queen. Um, and I do use that in a, a transgressive way. Um, it, it works because, of course, that's the role that would be available um, to to a woman, it is you know this role where she's on a pedestal, but then join with civil rights queen. Um, to continue, she does write the original complaint in Brown versus Board of Education. Um, she does research on that case, um, and she she does not litigate the case at the Supreme Court or in other courts. 
Um, but she, she is a vital part of that um, team. And then after Brown, she travels all across the South doing the work of actually implementing the case. It's not self-implementing. Um, it, it's one thing to for, for Thurgood Marshall and the other lawyers to celebrate the Supreme Court victory and to get a lot of professional accolades because of that. But the, the work that has to be done is going into the South, finding plaintiffs, litigating these cases in front of often horribly racist uh, judges. And she does all of that work, um, including just being an amazing tactician um, and doing, you know, handling these legal cases in a way that a lawyer of her stature uh, would not do today. She did some of her own grunt work. Mm -hmm. Now, going through the applications um, in the University of Georgia case and building the case up from the ground, cross-examining the registrar, showing that although Georgia claims that uh, race is not a, a disadvantage, that they would, um, that they treat the black plaintiffs Charlene Hunter Galt and Hamilton Holmes, just like everyone else, she exposes mm -hmm. that for a lie. Um, and, it, and it's just an amazing thing to, to think about that this is a person who, because of her legal acumen, her intellectual skills, opened the doors to higher education for African Americans in the South. And of course, that has an impact on uh, higher education generally. So I, I will I will pause there. Uh, it, you know, there's so many stories to be told about her. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned, um, you know, I sort of a, a two twofold question. I, I want to get to your point about um, you mentioned uh, Thurgood Marshall, um, but I also want to see if you can talk a little more about her performance. Right. Um, that that uh, you write that. Uh, she is talked about by newspapers across the country. Um, she is, um, you know, uh, black and white people are in awe or aghast uh, at her, her presence in the courtroom. Um, she's practicing and performing. Wow. Um, and, and, I, I, and, and she's doing it with a, a certain style, a certain mean. Uh, uh, she's, she's rocking these liberated threads to, to, to pull from another um, uh, historian. Uh, so she's deliberate. Like, can, can, you, can you speak about like her uh, choice in uh, th that presentation in, in a certain choreography of, of race and class and gender? Yeah, it's really important. Um... Her look is important. She is nearly six feet tall and physically imposing. And as you can imagine, that's an asset when she is going um, into these towns and interacting with these people uh, who frankly don't know what to do with her. Uh, her, her physical carriage helps her to make her way. She is always well-dressed um, with the latest fashions and she dresses um, perhaps the best reference to just make the point um, she, she wears pillbox hats like Jackie Kennedy um, you know, tailored clothes the American look mm -hmm. um, she believes in the politics of respectability and she's performing respectability uh, and so the interesting question is whether she wants to do this, right? Or, or whether it's instrumental, ultimately it doesn't matter because for a person like Motley, I think the performance and the personhood just sort of become mm -hmm. bound up together. Mm -hmm. uh, she wears a mask, so she is famously impassive. And James Meredith is the same way. People call him, they say he, he looks, he's robotic. Well, really they're just wearing a mask to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And so she ends up in these courtrooms, people are gawking at her, um, you know, the newspaper, newspapers all print um, stories about what she's wearing. And uh, she goes into these courtrooms, Mississippi is a great example. You know, these NAACP lawyers always need a local counsel. And in Mississippi, that person is this black lawyer, Jess Brown. 
And in contrast to Motley and Bob Carter, Jess Browns actually performs his subservience or what he understands the white people demand of him. He walks bent over when he's in the classroom. He never turns his back from mm -hmm. the judge. And it's just, you know, it, it's just so dramatic to think about it. Meanwhile, Motley's standing up there, all six feet of her, and she's just at, you know, she's cross-examining white men and women. And you can just, she, she's just transgressive by showing up. And that's not even, you know, taking account what she's actually doing with her mind. Um, so that's a, that's a little bit of the flavor of, of how she's performing. And this just continues. So it's not just in the South. It's when she's in New York City politics. And as a Manhattan Borough president, you know, it's, it's in part a ceremonial role. She goes to all of these dinners and ribbon cuttings. And um, she is immaculately dressed. Uh, and a, a, a good part of the story is describing her look and uh, explaining the role that her appearance and her, um, her threads are playing for her. It's also to draw a distinction uh, to someone like, well, a couple of people, Polly Murray, um, mm -hmm. Ella Baker. You know, Ella Baker famously talks about how one of the reasons that she encountered such difficulty with the ministers, including Dr. King, is that she didn't get all dolled up. You know, she, she was just not that kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, Polly Murray, obviously, um, is, you know, she's, she's gender transgressive. Mm -hmm. um, and she also isn't getting all dolled up. And then you have Constance Baker Motley. And she is performing this part. And of course, she is the person who enters, who becomes the outsider who can get on the inside. And uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, where she enters the picture on that spectrum. So along those lines, um, if, if um, you can talk about uh, work in womanhood, um, that, that and, and Marshall, Thurgood Marshall here too, um, because um, you write that um, this powerful line uh, that, that she was going to, um, she was not going to serve white men, she was going to cross-examine them. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but then we, we have this other dynamic uh, happening from Thurgood Marshall and some of her colleagues, her male colleagues who um, have a, a, an inner circle, you write. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, could you speak on uh, their relation, their working relationship, um, his, his, he's this guide, but also a gatekeeper? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Motley, all of her life, said that uh, she 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 said that Thurgood Marshall um, supported her career at a time when other men would not. If there had not been a Thurgood Marshall, there never would have been a Constance Baker Motley, which which is absolutely true. At the same time, as is often the case with mentors or sponsors, it's a tricky relationship. It's it's difficult in spots, and the difficulties all have to do with gender. Um, after all, as you said in the beginning, Molly's not supposed to be there. She's not supposed to be in a law office. Um, mm -hmm. It's a small office. Um, she's the only woman for most of her career there. And it is a, it is a masculine um, space. You know, Marshall is charismatic. He likes to tell stories, regale people, be the center of attention. He likes to drink. Um, and uh, he, he's just a, he's, he's, um, he's what you conjure when you conjure a, a charismatic male leader. Um, and he's, he's, to that extent, much like Dr. King. Um, Motley is different. Uh, she sort of keeps her head down, keeps herself to herself, does the work. And although she is certainly right that Marshall supports her, he makes use of her legal talents, she isn't ever quite a part of the inner circle. And it's that absence of belonging in the inner circle 
that ends up being a factor in her being denied uh, promotion when Marshall goes off to sit on the, um, the court. Someone has to take his position. Motley thinks that she might, she is interested. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't tap her in part, she thinks because of gender. He just didn't have the imagination to do uh, such a thing at that time. Um, she also thinks it has something to do with race because essentially it's advantageous to Marshall um, to be seen to anoint a white man in a context where uh, you know people are on his case about being anti-white. So th there are a lot of different factors and politics there that work to her disadvantage. And so the story I'm telling seeks to be nuanced to um, you know, contrast how Marshall embraces her with the closed door that she finds uh, in New York City law firms when she is interviewed or seeks to be interviewed by white male partners. But on the other hand, there is a gender through line Mm -hmm. um, that's important to accentuate. And to do so is to put her in the company, as I said, of Ella Baker and Polly Murray and these other women who had great impact, um, uh, but who until lately haven't gotten their due either. And so we are pushing the histori historiography forward in that way. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you you make this point that that your this work serves as a corrective to restore women to um, the story of civil rights history. Uh, the the uh, biographies on men in the movement um, are you you can't count them all, um, and and that's not intended to dismiss the contributions of those authors in in, in the subjects. Um, but you write that the historical significance, that historical significance is coded male in Western societies. Um, but I also wonder if Motley has been overlooked um, because she wasn't an activist, uh, mm. because she wasn't a radical. Uh, and perhaps this is another corrective that the, uh, the book is making. Uh, in addition to, I mean, we, we, we get books on Black activists and radicals. We have books on um, Black clubs women. Um, black farmers, uh, porters, uh, so on and so forth, but not really black lawyers um, and, and judges too. Um, and so I wonder, you know, where we might situate a black pragmatism mm -hmm. in, in um, uh, the black freedom struggle, uh, but also forgive me for um, any ambient noise that's coming through. Um, but also like, how does Motley's uh, career life encourage us to consider uh, her courtroom activism, if, if that's possible. Yeah. Uh, and, and is that another type of Black resistance? Absolutely, it is. And one of the um, advantages of this book sweeping across time is that one can appreciate that when these NAACP lawyers started out, they were deemed leftist. leftist. You know, Motley, even when she was up for confirmation, was said to be a communist. And um, it, you know well the story about how uh, the NAACP essentially um, had to declare itself anti-communist in the Cold War uh, politics context uh, to be able to continue to do its work. Um, and so once one follows her life over time, one can see that when Black power, for instance, comes onto the scene. Um, and even before that, when she's in New York City politics um, and she's in um, the same space as Malcolm X, Adam Clayton Powell, um, mm. she, she just looks very different from them. And the, the rhetoric that they use is bombastic. You know, there's sort of some uh, just very cutting uh, rhetoric about those who are not engaging in the same tactics as they are, including, you know, Malcolm X, obviously, uh, uh, criticizing Dr. King. And so um, it, it's within that context that she sort of gets pushed to the back and uh, of the historical record. And it's exacerbated by her going on the court. Um, it, most judges are not well known unless it's a Supreme Court justice. 
Um, we just don't know very much about um, judges as historical actors. So that also is a reason um, that she is lesser known. And I hope that this work can, as you say, um, uh, start to create a category um, of uh, pragmatists, courtroom activists that can be seen as complements to uh, those who become increasingly radical. And, and I think that needs to be the case because frankly, um, it takes all kinds. And of course the radicals and the pragmatists ultimately in the white imagination are all in it together anyway, right? Um, and there's a picking and choosing um, uh, of policy prescriptives and, and all kinds of objectives based on the whole complement of people. And so I, I do think it's important to uh, try to see the, the broad sweep and see all of these people interacting mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, so, so now I wanna ask you about uh, Motley the judge. Uh, and, and really Motley the insider. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the enduring challenges in, in tropes of the long black freedom struggle is, is getting access, getting on the inside, um, whether it's to the vote, uh, to labor markets, educational institutions, um, and, and to make change, whether it's incremental or radical, right? Um, and so in, in recent years, we, we've seen mass protests uh, in the name of Black Lives Matter. Um, we've seen uh, the movement from protest to politics, as, as be it Rustin would term it, uh, the presidential run of uh, Kamala Harris, um, Stacey Abrams running for governor, Black women district attorneys uh, in New York and, and Georgia. So to some ex extent, though, you problematize this on both ends. Um, can Black people achieve liberation through litigation? Uh, is it to be achieved through mass protests? Uh, you, you, you show how Motley was changed by the March on Washington in 63. Or is it to be achieved by occupying positions of power and working from the inside? Um, you know, she achieves a number of extraordinary positions, uh, but did this make her more transformational? Uh, and if less so, um, you, as you theorize throughout the book, was this the price of the ticket? Mm, yeah. So she definitely was a transformational figure when she was a lawyer, um, like, a, like a gladiator, uh, identifying injustice and, and going after it with her um, lawyer colleagues. There's no question in my mind that the appointment to the judiciary was in many ways a moderating moderating. Uh, uh, influence um, on her, it had to be because it's an entirely different role um, with particular constraints, um, you know, built into the law is the status quo uh, through the concept of stare decisis. So you have to follow precedent, you have to find a workaround. Um, it is ultimately a pretty conservative um, professional field. It's important that she does achieve that um, but I, I would say that ultimately, again, thinking about seeing all of these different groups of mm -hmm. activists uh, occupying the same uh, political space, it, it would be important um, for uh, you know, mass resistors um, to create the conditions under which a judge, no matter who the judge is, uh, would would be able to see what the issues truly are. And if there's a claim that's presented that crystallizes or captures the grievance um, to see it in the way that the movement sees it. That is, you know, ultimately I'm a scholar of social movements and I do think that um, one has to, to be effective, have uh, the, the movement politics and the insider politics working hand in hand, or at least interacting. And so that, that's the way I ultimately see it. And uh, yes, the, the price of the ticket, um, it, it's really you know, the, the price for the group um, because obviously Motley achieved a lot of success. Um, what I'm pushing back on is the notion that individual success and group advancement 
are somehow snugly linked. I really don't think they are. Um, and, and that's not just in the law, it's in a variety of spaces. I mean, we could see it, if you think about um, politics, obviously Barack Obama, um, there are all sorts of constraints on what people can achieve once they are uh, in positions of authority. And uh, it's important to, to sort of wake up to that. And it's not uh, that the, um, the reaction, in my view, should not be to sort of tisk tisk at the individual, um, but to realize that the system's sort of working in the logic of the system, right? right? And uh, the, the 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 activists, the people on the ground, need to keep going um, once once representation is achieved. Mm -hmm. I I, um, I want to see if I can sneak in one more question before we uh, turn to the audience. Um, uh, so you mentioned Ella Baker um, it, it, and, and some others. I think we've recently gotten uh, some amazing biographies of uh, looking at Baker, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, um, James Baldwin, Lorraine Hansberry, and even Clarence Thomas, right? Um, and, and I think your book joins in this, but it also does something different. Um, your, your sources are wide and extensive manuscript collections, magazines, newspapers, interviews. Um, the archive was not silent on mm -hmm. my, right? Historians were, mm -hmm. um, in, 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 un, until now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and maybe this is another component of the price of the ticket, uh, that the paradox of her success, the paradox of Black excellence, uh, that historians can overlook you too if you're too successful. It's not enough struggle there. Right, mm -hmm. um, and 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 also white backlash looms large in the book. Uh, violence against um, these black students who were seeking admission to uh, white universities, but there's also a professional backlash against uh, Motley in in some ways. If we consider her uh, later trajectory, um, so so what I'm getting at is is um, how do we begin to do justice? to her legacy. She's done so much for us, this uh, daughter of West Indian immigrants who helped change the American experiment, right? Uh, but how do we begin to do justice for her and her legacy? Hmm. Well, uh, I have to say that this book has been released in such a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it actually was delayed because of COVID. There was just a backlog of, of books to be published and I was so disappointed. And are you, are you sure you can't get it out earlier? And it turns out that the coincidence of the book's publication and Biden's promise and nomination have really breathed a lot of um, life into her legacy. Um, and I, I think that you know, many more people will know about Constance Baker Motley um, now uh, because with this nominee, people are looking for historical um, understanding. And so I do think that uh, the book and the book published right now will help us to appreciate this amazing woman, what she was able to do, um, what some of the uh, constraints were on her um, as we look to the future and consider um, what this new first will be able to do um, and not be able to do. Uh, and I, I'm just very happy um, that this book is out in the world at this time. Indeed. Um, Mac, if you want to uh, bring in some of the questions from the audience. Yes, this has been excellent. And uh, there are some questions from the audience that I'll share with you now. The first um, is from my colleague, Deborah Gardner, uh, the Roosevelt House historian. She points out that Constant Baker Motley and Eleanor Roosevelt were the same height and shared an interest in good clothes. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt was a big supporter of civil rights. When did they meet and what was their relationship? Uh, Deborah also uh, notes that Eleanor had a strong relationship with two other strong-minded African-American women who were very different, Mary, Mary McLeod Bethune and, of course, Pauli Murray. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So to my knowledge, um, they, they did not have any close relationship, but um, Motley did meet or at least observe uh, Eleanor Roosevelt in the context of 
um, the New Deal social programs. Motley actually worked for the National Youth Administration uh, and was influenced by, it was actually at NYU. She was influenced by the example of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the example of public service uh, and it is a nice connection to note and to make. That's great. Um, a sort of general question from Jasmine Dulcine. What is the single most captivating information you learned in the writing process? Single most captivating information? Uh, hard to say. Um, single most. I will mention that I was it was very helpful to learn about a tragedy in the family um, involving uh, John Huggins, her first cousin once removed. He was uh, a part of the family, young man who ended up joining the Panthers and was gunned down on the campus of UCLA, uh, sort of caught up in COINTELPRO, uh, mm -hmm. never, it just never would have crossed my mind that this this would have been a part of the family's history. It was um, and was vitally important to me as I started to look at her um, cases on the bench because it turns out that she issued a decision that was a landmark in the context of prisoners' rights litigation. She also was at the forefront of pushing back against the Rockefeller drug laws by uh, uh, treating uh, some uh, incarcerated people who came before her uh, with a lot of respect and dignity. And I do think that um, it's related to not only the people she met in her legal practice, but that family experience. Uh, so that, that certainly captivated me. Um. An anonymous questioner asks, can you talk about Constance Baker Motley's work as a lawyer helping to represent Martin Luther King and their relationship generally? Yeah, um, King admired Motley, um, was very fond of her. She was very fond of him. I do write about their relationship in the book and note that King was able to appreciate Motley in a way that uh, Ella Baker did not think he appreciated her. And a part of it was because of, uh, you know, Motley's self-presentation, her professional role. She was a lawyer. She had uh, some skills that King essentially had to uh, respect. And so they, they, had a, they had a good relationship. And yet um, that they did does not necessarily uh, say much of anything about uh, King and gender more generally. Another questioner asks uh, first a statement. During the early 1960s, Northern white lawyers from large firms often came to the South for short term stints to represent jailed African Americans and get their cases moved from state to federal court to give them a better chance to escape severe punishment. Did Motley interact with any of these lawyers? She did. Um... She interacted with, uh, gosh, his name is escaping me right now. Everybody knows him. Um, flowing hair, curly hair. Uh, what is his name? I can't believe I can't remember. But yeah, she was, she was a part of that group. Um, and those cases were really important. I actually wrote about them in my prior book, uh, the way in which these, these lawyers would help to get those cases removed. Um, and give the individuals a chance for, for freedom and the movement to continue its work. Another question, uh, an anonymous question. What are your thoughts, what are your own thoughts on the nomination of Ms. Kentaji Brown Jackson? And what do you think Judge Motley would say about this moment in history with respect to President, Bri President Biden's nomination of a black woman to the Supreme Court? She would be thrilled. Uh, she would be happy that this moment, which has been a long time coming, has finally arrived. Uh, I personally view it as a win for workplace equality, uh, a long struggle. Um, I'm, I'm happy about it. It also reminds me that of, of some of the, what 
Professor Haywood called backlash against Motley. Uh, you know, she was recommended for higher courts, including the Supreme Court, uh, but didn't have that available to her because of the pushback against her having uh, been a civil rights lawyer. And so I, I think that uh, Judge Jackson is standing on the shoulders of Constance Baker Motley and uh, I'm pleased with that. Here's a question from a uh, former, uh, a recent student of yours, uh, Professor Haywood, uh, Cece. Um, she thanks you for being here and for the book, Ms. brown Nigan, and she says, given Motley's historical impact on social racial, racial justice, and her leadership for Black women in the civil rights movement. Can you expound upon what Miss Motley's life's work means in this moment? Uh, oftentimes, Black deliberate leaders are reduced to symbols, she says, but their journeys in all its forms are much more than that. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, you know, symbols are important, and Motley was certainly a symbol of change, but the, the purpose of excavating uh, her life in this book is to show her impact in three distinct roles, including politics, uh, where, uh, just to give you a taste of it, uh, she uh, showed how important it is to have control of budgets. Um, uh, the, the New York City budget was a tool of social change in her hand when she was Manhattan Borough President. Um, her lawyering was transformational. And I, I commend to you some of the cases that she worked on and uh, commend the profession to a lot of young people now that the civil rights lawyers are again on the back foot with respect to legal precedents um, with a lot of uh, you know, pushback. And th there's a cycle here. Um, where essentially the same cases are litigated or brought over uh, again and again. Um, and, and this has been, you know, the story of America, right? Uh, from slavery to reconstruction and, and so forth. And so we're in that cycle. Um, she did her part and it, it's up to uh, current generations uh, and future generations to do their part. And then the, the piece about judging, uh, as I've mentioned, it's important to have uh, individuals who care about social justice in these positions, and yet freedom is a constant struggle and we all have to play our role. Mm. So thank you. Uh, so, so we will make that the last question. Uh, we just want to thank you, uh, Professor Brown Nagin, for um, this extraordinary book and, and, and sharing uh, your thoughts about it. Uh, to uh, thank you also to President Rab, uh, Harold Holzer, and the Roosevelt House, and uh, pick up the book. Uh, it is uh, fascinating. It's it's um, so timely and and um, and so insightful. Uh, I think it reminds us of the perils of. Uh, missing all the heroes and their contributions in, in the contributors. So uh, thank you again, Professor brown -Aiken. Thank you so much for being such a great interlocutor. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.